This is the Ahsoka Podcast on TV Podcast Industries. We are talking about Star Wars Ahsoka, Episode 1, Master and Apprentice, and Episode 2, Toil and Trouble. So, where do you call home these days? The ship serves me fine. Still? Don't you ever get tired of moving from one place to another? I go where I'm needed. Not always. You never make things easy. Why should I? You never made things easy for me, Master. Welcome back, fellow Rebels to TV Podcast Industries. We're starting another brand new show, Star Wars Ahsoka. This time we're talking about the first two episodes of Ahsoka, hopefully season one, Master and Apprentice, and episode two, Toil and Troll. I'm one of your hosts, Derek. Hello there, fellow Rebels, and dare I say, Choppers uh-huh. as well. Yes, I am Designation John, or C1 slash 10P. Very good, very good. A.K.A. Chopper. A.K.A. Chopper. Our favourite murderous robot is back in Indeed, the Star Wars universe. he is. And hopefully everybody so falls happy. in love with him in live action as much as they did in uh, animated form when he was on Rebels. Well, he probably is animated as well. In this. He is also animated. This. <laughs> Just better. Yeah, yeah, that's true. We, we well, have, differently. I we've seen him in live action, sort of, at, uh, at like celebration and stuff. We've seen him moving around, a real full-size version of him, like it's all with the R2-D2, you know? So, uh, yeah. yes, but there's probably some additional CGI the same. on him. But, yes. yes, there are some shows that hit us here in TV Podcast Industries right in our sweet spot. This year, we've already had a few of them. We had The Last of Us, because all of us are video gamers, absolutely love The Last of Us TV show. It was really good. It hit all three of us really hard. There's some shows coming up later on this year. We've got The Boys spin-off. We're big fans of The Boys. We've got Invincible, which is one of Chris's favorite comic books, uh, brought to life an animated form we've got wheel of time coming up next month which i know yourself and chris are big fans of and i had secret invasion starring nick fury up this year which is also hits me in my sweet spot and here we are right now in star wars we covered star wars the bad batch the animated series so that we could get to a specific live action show which was star wars ahsoka and john this is right in your wheelhouse of star wars absolutely it has uh the big bad of Grand Admiral Thrawn mm-hmm. and the big bad good in Chopper. Yes. Because I adored this robot in uh, the Rebels mm-hmm. animated series. So, yeah, I'm absolutely gagging for this series. Absolutely. And the rest of the team, of course, we've got Hiro Syndulla in here. We've got Sabine Wren in here. We have mention already of Ezra. Yeah, Bridger. Ezra Bridger. I keep wanting to correct myself because I keep saying Ezra Miller in my head. It's Ezra Bridger, <laughs> of course. Um, I, I say you're the big fan of it. I have watched every episode of Rebels as well. Uh, John, you've watched it a couple of times through. Uh, I've watched it a few times myself as well. But you're the bigger fan of Rebels, I would say. But I loved the show as well. So uh, there are definitely things taken from Rebels. There was talk before coming into the series that this was going to be live action at uh, Rebels Season 5. It does take place directly afterwards, but I think there's enough done here to not have had to have seen Rebels to enjoy the show. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, you can make connections, and I, mm-hmm. you know, I've seen tweets from the official Star Wars um, page, which is kind of pointing fans and watchers to um, the, the different episodes within not just Rebels, but yep. also Clone Wars as well, uh, to, uh, that can... You know, provide some background to some of the things that go on. But yeah. certainly, I think, um, you know, it's also self contained. And also, uh, to another tweet, you know, talking about the Star Wars universe, you know, when episode four, A New Hope, came out, you were just plonked yeah. into this whole new world. And, um, you know, there was talk of the Clone Wars, mm-hmm. which you, you know, it took another 30. 35 years before anything particularly meaningful happened on that, yeah. you know, uh, and in, in terms of the prequels, but also then the animated series yeah. of the Clone Wars. So I think you can also just let it 
wash over you and, and, and take it in. And and there's enough stuff here for this particular story. Absolutely, you know? absolutely. And I, th- I think it's bringing along uh, new people who've not seen um, most of these characters before. And yeah, exactly. Like I say, just like the original Star Wars, you dropped in here, you may not know all the characters, but there should be enough there for you to, to latch onto. We'd love to know from you uh, fellow Rebels if there's things that you uh, don't know, things that you didn't know uh, off the bat. But the big difference here between Star Wars and 77 and here we are now in the Ahsoka series, you can go back and watch loads of stuff that will lead it up to you. If you are interested enough, you can Google it. You can go yeah. onto Wikipedia and get it. We, when we were watching these movies for the first time, had to just wait for more movies and uh, hopefully get some answers to questions like, what are the Clone Wars? Uh, who are the Stormtroopers? Is Darth Vader a robot or is he a man? You know, those kind of things that you wouldn't have any idea of when you watch it for the first time. Yeah. But we have been really excited to talk about this. Ahsoka as a character herself has only appeared in live action before, played by Rosario Dawson in the, in two episodes of The Mandalorian, right? We haven't seen her in live action other than that. And she's been around for 15 years. She's got a huge backstory getting her to this point. So it's really interesting to see all of our favorite actresses, Rosario Dawson, who appeared in loads of the Defenders TV shows for Marvel on Netflix. We saw her loads of there seeing her now at the centre of a series again. It's great to have her back on TV podcast industries, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, What I, you know, I guess just to begin on a little sad note Mm -hmm. is that we do have to say that Ray Stevenson, who who plays Balan Skull, uh, the Jedi Master or Mm. Sith Master, uh, depending on how you're viewing it, then... It is, uh, you know, he passed away the between effectively Star Wars celebration yeah. the, in London this year and the start of this show. So it was good to see for our friend Ray at the end of episode one, just before Absolutely. the credits as well. So, you know, a yeah. little sad note, but hopefully, uh, you know, this final outing for, for Ray Stevenson, uh, certainly it is kind of a, a good epitaph as well for him. Absolutely, absolutely. We, we've seen Ray Stevenson in the Thor movies. We've seen him yeah. in Punisher. Um, Warzone, he played uh, He played the Punisher in there. Uh, he's just a character actor who's been around for such a long time. And at Star Wars Celebration, he was so excited about yeah. this role in Star Wars. He said, you know, the first time he was given his lightsaber, he flipped it around like he was a six-year-old kid again, you know, really excited to be in this role and be in this universe. So, uh, yeah, as you say, I hope this is a good epitaph for uh, his excellent career. Yes, uh, for sure. Um, so, fellow Rebels, if you are joining us for the first time, mm-hmm. you can pop on over to our website at tvpodcastindustries.com to subscribe on any Jedi or Sith orientated podcast catcher of your choice. Absolutely. You can also head on over to the website as well, where you can leave a voicemail if you wish for our feedback section. Yeah. And of course, you can send any emails to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com for feedback as well. Because any theories, comments, thoughts, observations, critiques uh, on the series is so welcome. We love to get your thoughts and theories on the TV shows that we cover. Absolutely. Another great way to get in contact with us, pop on over to our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash TV podcast industries, where we'll put up a spoiler post every week for each of the episodes. You can leave your thoughts on there as well. One other thing we should say right up front, we will be conducting our cantina quiz. Yes, that's a lot of alliteration there. Our cantina quiz effectively consists of one question per episode. Gather them all together, uh, send them in to us with all the correct answers at the end of the season uh, to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com to be able the chance of getting your hands on some Star Wars Ahsoka goodies. Yes, good stuff. Uh, Looking forward to those questions. And of course, normally we would be joined by our other co-host, Chris, um, who can't make it for tonight's recording so uh, we hope to see him in our galaxy far, far away very soon. We will. I, I believe he's back next week. He's just taking care of his own little Padawan learner. Exactly. Choice. So, uh, Good so stuff. He's unable to be on the podcast. Um, Padawan learners uh, are unable to speak on mic yet. Exactly. <laughs> is it a Padawan or is it an apprentice? It might be. It might be. Let's uh, let's get into our discussion about the, about episode one and two of Ahsoka. We will be covering both episodes as one as they were released the, the way they were. Indeed, yes. Let us get into our spoiler filled discussion. Derek, give us the who, what, where, when, and how of episode one of season one of Ahsoka. 
and episode two of Ahsoka as well, Master and Apprentice and Toil and Trouble. Well, of course, executive producer for this show is Dave Filoni, one of the creators behind most of the characters used in this show, uh, making the transition from uh, animation to live action. Uh, he is also amazingly the writer and director of the first episode of this series as well. Um, Dave Filoni has been the guiding hand behind a lot of Star Wars since George Lucas moved on away from the universe. He's been so central behind it. And this is his baby. This is his project that he's been trying to get to life for quite a long time. So uh, great to see him behind the scenes um, uh, as the lead writer and director of this episode. Uh, Episode two, also written by Dave Filoni and directed by Steph Green. Uh, Steph directed an episode of the Book of Boba Fett already, so has worked in Star Wars TV before and directed an episode of The Watchmen in the past. Yeah, Yes, another series that we covered Another one of our favorite series that we covered as well. Yeah, absolutely. And Steph is directing the third episode of Soka, so she'll be back for the next episode as well. Excellent stuff. And also, I should just say, we do have a little bit of a crossover with the show that we are just about to finish up Mm -hmm. as well. We have one last episode to cover from season two of the Good Omens TV show. Yep. Which stars, of course, David Tennant. Yes. uh, And he is here back reprising his voice acting. Yeah. uh, For the droid Hu Yang. Yes, he is. Yes. Hu Yang appeared in uh, The Clone Wars back in season five um, as the instructor uh, working with Padawans on how they build their lightsabers. That is his role in the show here. You'll see a lot more of him uh, talking to uh, to various Jedi-type characters about building their lightsabers, I guess. And yes, interestingly, he was teaching Gunji, uh, a Wookiee Padawan, uh, who also appeared in our last foray into the Star Wars world, or galaxy, I mm-hmm. should say, uh, in The Bad Batch Season 2. Yeah, it was cool to see Gunji in the in the Bad Batch. And uh, by the way, fellow Rebels, you should be able to get all of our episodes of the Bad Batch coverage on this very feed right here where you're listening to this podcast because it's also going to be on our Bad Batch feed as well. So uh, go back and watch the Bad Batch if you're looking for something else in the Star Wars universe. John, would you like to tell us what they all gave us with your synopsis for Star Wars Ahsoka Episode 1, Master and Apprentice, and Episode 2, Toil and Trouble? Sure. Balin Skull and his apprentice, Shin Haiti, assault a New Republic cruiser carrying Lady Morgan Elspeth, who had previously been captured by Ahsoka Tano. The pair rescue Lady Elspeth, who informs Skull that Ahsoka is searching for Grand Admiral Thrawn. Ahsoka and her droid Huyang obtain a star map to the location of the banished Grand Admiral Thrawn, despite an attempt by Skull's assassin droids to prevent her and obtain the star map for their master. Ahsoka is informed of Lady Elspeth's escape by Home One. Regrouping with the fleet, Ahsoka meets with General Hera Sendula, but Hoyang reveals that the star map is locked. Sindula advises Ahsoka to go to her former Padawan, Sabrine Wren, to use her artistic skills to help unlock the map. On the planet Lethal, the tense relationship between Ahsoka and Sabine is palpable, and when Ren takes the star map to unlock it back at her home outside of the city, she is ambushed by two assassin droids and the apprentice, Shin, who steal it. As Sabine tries to stop Shin, a lightsaber duel ensues, and Shin seriously wounds Sabine. In episode 2, after the attack on Sabine, she recovers at Lothal's medical facility, and soon puts her tech skills to use as she hacks one of the assassin droids' memories. They discover that it had come to Lothal from Corellia. In the Denab system on the planet Cetos, Balen Skull, Shin and Elspeth, at an ancient structure, activates the star map, which plots a course to another galaxy along the mythological pathway to Peridia. To reach Thrawn, Elspeth orders Shin to Corellia to oversee Marok's final preparations for the final delivery for Elspeth's ship, the Eye of Sion. Elsewhere, in order to recover the star map, Ahsoka and Syndulla travel to the Corellian shipyards. But as they're inspecting one of Elspeth's former shipyard assets, a massive hyperdrive begins to depart the shipyard, and the pair soon realise that sympathy for the Empire still lingers in the dockyards of Corellia. As Ahsoka goes to stop Shin and Marok, the hyperdrive begins its ascent to space. Followed by Hera and Chopper in the Phantom, Hera weaves to avoid the blaster fire from the transporter ship and gets Chopper to attach a tracking device. 
As the Empire sympathizers are rounded up, Ahsoka heads back to Lothal following a talk with Hera to see if Sabine will come to help find Thrawn, prevent another war, and to find her friend and former rebel, the Jedi Ezra Bridger. Sabine Wren is ready. Excellent stuff. Yes, Sabine Wren back in her full Mandalorian outfit, looking very cool. Certainly uh, at the is. End of the episode, yeah. uh, cutting back that long wavy hair that we see her with uh, at the beginning of the ep- at the beginning of these two episodes as well. Uh, very cool. What we do on our Star Wars podcasts usually is our blaster points, our uh, bullet points, uh, if you will, in the Star Wars universe. I think this time we're going to move it to saber points. Our top five saber points, because lots of sabers going on in this show. It certainly is. Aren't there? So let's start there with our saber point number one. Yeah, this one's liberating Lady Morgan Elspeth. I think it's only fitting that we start off uh, our coverage of the show with uh, with this big moment of the opening scene with uh, with Ray Stevenson. Lots of callbacks here to A New Hope and how it started. You start off with this villain arriving on a Republic cruiser on a mission to recover something important to the Empire. There's no Empire anymore. This is taking place after uh, Return of the Jedi. But what he's trying to recover here is Morgan Elspeth, a character with big ties to uh, Grand Admiral Thrawn. Yes, and the Mandalorian uh, series yeah. as well, where... Uh, she was captured by Ahsoka. That was the mission, yeah. Yeah, that was the mission. Not only throw back to that, but I got serious um, Jaws oh, really? vibes from the ship, actually. Right. <laughs> As, uh, because actually we have Star Wars in red with a red horizontal crawl mm-hmm. rather than the angled crawl. And as that fades, you get this new Republic cruiser ship just coming up but it the front of the the cruiser to me looked like that classic jaws Jaws movie poster and if you freeze it at the right time Uh Uh, so yeah no i thought that was kind of quite cool it just flashed through my mind as i saw it but yeah absolutely um it's a lot of uh you know immediately the connections back to the mandalorian here Mm -hmm. with uh lady elspeth uh being rescued but also, you know, with the new here, seeing um, Balin Skull uh, and his uh, apprentice, uh, Shin Haiti, as mm-hmm. well, which was really good. I mean, I do think that uh, <laughs> it's interesting, you know, the ship that comes on board. I, if I was the captain there, I just wouldn't have let it on. Well, yeah. But I guess with the old Jedi codes, yeah. um, then I guess he has to. But again... The, well, he, he feels like it's it's former Imperials that are just trying to push their luck. So he's, yeah. he's making sure they land somewhere that he's waiting for them. So in the past, in previous Star Wars movies, we, even we would see our, the Rebels use codes from uh, from the Empire to try and get aboard ships. And they usually sneak aboard once they've got past things like tractor beams and, uh, and shields, that kind of stuff. So w- what his plan here is, hang on a second, you're using the old Rebel trick. I'm calling your bluff here, right? So land right in front of me. He doesn't believe that he's going to be uh, face-to-face with a possible former Jedi or someone with uh, with the kind of powers that uh, that Balin has. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and you know, it's it's to, it's to his mistake, but uh, yeah. you know, because effectively these two manage to kill a whole detachment and scupper this new cruiser. Absolutely, um, it's a, a new New Republic cruiser. <laughs> yes, and um, so you know, it's 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 a big deal, uh, and hence why Ahsoka is. is uh, contacted about the loss of uh, the Lady Morgan Elspeth. Yeah. Um, I do think, though, as well, the other hint that um, the captain should have gotten is the the hydraulic pressure venting when the door opens uh, uh-huh. from an Imperial ship is always by a factor of at least 20 uh-huh. more kind of dry, icy and smoky. It certainly is. Because uh, <laughs> you, you see a huge amount. I always remember it. I mean, it's a great effect mm-hmm. that you see sort of when the Emperor is coming down from uh, the, the that type of ship as well, which, yeah. again, is another hint that it, it's not uh, going to end well. And then with Balin Skull and his apprentice sort of, in black or dark robes Mm -hmm. uh, is like, I I would have been getting a little bit twitchy at that stage if I was the captain. Have I made the right call here? I don't know. Uh, But yes, we get that great line um, from Balin Skull 
where he says, uh, after the captain has asked him for uh, his identification, mm-hmm. he says, you were right, we are no Jedi. Absolutely. Just really delivered so well. Yeah, well, as, as he pushes his lightsaber straight through him, his well, orange yeah. lightsaber. And interestingly, in Star Wars lore, an orange lightsaber is usually chosen by a Force user who hasn't chosen the side of either Jedi nor Sith. So it's in between the two. And what we do learn a little bit about, about Balin is that he's a mercenary for hire, yeah. along with this apprentice that he has. So exactly. he's not necessarily a Sith. He's not necessarily going to go down the path of he's now the new Sith Lord taking over from Vader after Vader's dead or anything like that. This is a mercenary for hire who has the skills of a Jedi. Well, it's interesting as well, I think, because we do hear in episode two from Balin after he's effectively been ordered to stop Ahsoka mm-hmm. and and to kill her. Yeah. And um, that for him, that's a shame because there's such few Jedi left. Exactly. Um, and to which Elspeth says, you know, you're being sentimental. Mm-hmm. And he goes, no, it's the truth. Yes. Um, yeah. However, his apprentice in this opening uh, moment does unleash a red lightsaber. That's true. Yep. And... I guess the dark under her eyes as well is very much more suggestive that she has picked a side here. I think she may have. I think um, she may have. For sure. But the two of them are working as mercenaries. That's what we, yes. that's what we hear in here. And I know there's, there's even a mention from Hu Yang, the uh, droid played by uh, David Tennant. He even mentions that Balin had gone through the Jedi Order. He'd gone through his training um, and built his own lightsaber. So he's absolutely aware of who uh, of who the character is. So yeah. it's a really intriguing character to see here. Definitely. As, as you say, this kind of opening, very reminiscent of the more traditional Star Wars movies with its opening crawl, with the uh, the ship coming uh, from, from off-screen, massive, gigantic ship, and being uh, infiltrated by what you think of the villains here. Yeah. And just one final thing on, on Balin's skull is that, you know, Yang also says, you know, he disappeared at the end of the Clone Wars. Yes. So, yeah. in effect, you know, having been trained as a Jedi was making sure he just didn't get killed. And exactly. has probably become a bit of a hustler, mm-hmm. uh, hence the mercenary type. Yes, another one that was missed out by Order 66, effectively. Um but the big bad really here is Lady Morgan Elspeth, yeah. and that's because of her connection to Grand Admiral Thrawn, who's been missing for all of this time since before Star Wars A New Hope, all the way until where we are now after Return of the Jedi. So it's about 15 years, if I remember my my timeline correctly. So quite a long time has passed yeah. uh, during that period where uh, he's been gone. And she has this connection with him. She had worked with him really closely before he disappeared. And she seems to have this connection with him, this idea that he is still alive and still around in the universe. That's what That's the information that Ahsoka wanted from her. On behalf of the rebels as well. Well, that's it, and it's actually it's two points around Elspeth uh, for me mm. is that you know it is that she's driving this plot to find Grand Admiral Thrawn yeah. and to bring the disparate Imperial remnants back together mm-hmm. uh, to pro- provide that leadership uh, to the uh, the remnants of the Empire. Mm-hmm. It's the fact that what's being built on here compared to the Mandalorian is. Her connection with the Night Sisters mm-hmm. or the Witches of uh, Dathomir, yes, as well. That you know she has a connection to the Force. You know, a Force sensitivity yeah. by being connected to uh, the Night Sisters, which is great. Sort of having this brought in because it was something very much in Clone Wars, mm-hmm. um, as well as Rebels. I think. Uh, that yeah, they were in here, and yeah, and, and even more recently, they were in uh, the video game Jedi Fallen Order, and uh, yeah, very big characters in there that are that are connected to them. Um, but it, but there's one of the things that that you would definitely point out about Rebels if you've never seen the show. It is more of a spiritual show. It does focus on a lot more spiritual, mystical, really magical does. elements of the Star Wars, and universe. that's what I love here. That this yeah. is tapping into it is the the mystical, you know force side of star wars and connecting that theme from the rebels into this you know in the rebels you had uh owls and wolves as force sensitive uh, creatures and then you also had this really kind of strange uh creature called bendu that kind of could understand both the 
the Jedi and Sith, the the light and dark side of the okay. forces as well yeah. uh, in the Rebels. So I love that this is bring, being brought through because I think um, this is great because when I first saw them in Clone Wars mm. uh, with Darth Maul and his brother, it was just a really sort of intense moment um, that they had. And so I, I, I think this is one of the great things that just these opening moments um, as well. And I think important to Elspeth. Absolutely, absolutely. It'll be it'll be great to see that development of the character, and there's, and there's more of her in in episode two, more of these characters in episode two. But a great opening uh, for the series. Let's move on to our main character in our saber point number two. <laughs> Yeah, Ahsoka retrieving the map to Thrawn. This is her big intro. She gets a, another big um, dramatic introduction and a big action-filled introduction as she uh, lands on the planet where she's able to find this map to the location where they think Thrawn has been banished to. Uh, learn a little bit more, more about that as the episode goes on, that effectively she feels that Imperials have it in their mind. There's rumours going around that Thrawn has survived. And if they think that... And if they feel that this place holds the map to where Thrawn is, she needs to get that map before they do. Um, so that that didn't come through the first time I watched the episode. I was trying to work out how a map from thousands of years ago could point the direction to somebody that got banished 15 years beforehand. But it's the place that they feel that he may have ended up as. And that's where all the rumors are going around between uh, on all the back channels. That, yeah. That's where he is. And she had interrogated Elspeth mm-hmm. as well. Yeah. Also, not necessarily um, adhering to the Jedi rules that we hear. Exactly. Um, in the same way that her droid, Hu Yang, does um, in terms of parking the ship way too far away. <laughs> Certainly given what happens to the assassin droids that have been sent to find this yeah. uh, star map. And, of course, cross paths with Ahsoka while she's at this old temple complex uh, on the planet Arcana. I I love this moment. It it feels really Indiana Jones. It feels really even even video game. It feels like the the Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order kind of game where she needs to go through this puzzle in order to find the box and take it out with her. And then she's surrounded by these assassin droids outside. I love the battle. Um, Ahsoka using one of her awesome tricks of... Her both of her lightsabers using the force to spin them around so she can cut a hole to get below and then using that same trick to uh, spin the sabers and, and take out the assassin yeah, droids from cool. below. Really cool. Um, and then the backup plan that's from the assassin's droids when they've been <laughs> taken out is self-destruct. That explosion takes that's out massive. half the planet. Yeah. Um, absolutely destroyed. I was not expecting so much destruction from that. No, um, not at all. It was a proper fireball. Yeah. Um, and certainly to the point that Ahsoka's having to, like, peg it away mm-hmm. from them uh, and jump on board uh, her ship uh, as as Ho Yang is uh, coming to collect her. Absolutely. But, uh, yeah, it was a great kind of opening again just the inside the chamber sort of figuring out and and Mm -hmm. just as you say indiana jones-esque really good i love the 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 witches are on the wall Mm -hmm. carved into the stone so but she gets it and it's locked she's not able to actually uh, uncover the secrets contained within this star map, which is this globe um, that she's gotten from this central plinth in the temple yeah. sort of antechamber, I guess. It just feels like a classic um, Star Wars, particularly animation and TV show story where you need to go and find this object and then you have to go and find the unlock key for it yeah. and then you have to go and find the next uh, step in this process. All these elements have to build up to it as a way of bringing all these characters together around uh, around your main characters. Uh, particularly Ahsoka as a character, she was used quite often in the Clone Wars as an investigator, as somebody who would um, who would be sent out to do the investigation yeah, and learn what was going on, usually yeah. by Anakin or by the, uh, the the Jedi Order, the Jedi Council, uh, would send her out to do uh, to those kind of things. So seeing her here, again, it's a more Indiana Jones moment, but seeing her here on this investigation and using her her knowledge and her abilities to to solve this um this puzzle I thought was a great a great first opener for Ahsoka and of course an excellent lightsaber action scene. Yeah, absolutely. And I actually I really like the touch as they were taking off from the planet's surface mm-hmm. to escape the fireball 
and as they were going into space, just how it got darker, but also you got the vapor trails on the 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 windows of uh, Ahsoka's ship mm, as cool. well, which yeah. I just thought was really really cool. Yeah. Actually, the other thing I just remembered as well is with Balin's skull. I say breaking Elspeth out of her mm. her prison cell aboard the the Republic cruiser. Um, I love the fact he uses the force to to uh, move the port key. Oh yes, um, yeah. which you normally see droids operating. Yeah, um, and I think that's the first time I've seen the inner workings of those ports. So, like yeah. that was a kind of a little nerd out moment for me because <laughs> it was just like the most recent Lego game, Absolutely. Star Wars Lego game. So yeah, I was <laughs> just like, oh, that's really cool. <laughs> and, when you said just like the game, I thought you meant uh, you meant one of the one of the. Uh, Big Star Wars, uh, big budget Star Wars games, but Lego Star Wars is also one of the biggest games uh, of this year as well. So I totally understand. Uh, excellent stuff. Um, but Ahsoka retrieves the map. She takes it back to General Hera Sandula, and we get uh, a moment between the two of them. Um, I love that that General Sandula does seem like that really strong character uh, that we've seen before. She's Absolutely. now a proper leader in this new republic. She has um, a big assigned role to her. She is a general here. Um, but I also like that she defers to Ahsoka here. She tells her what's happened with um, Lady Elspeth. She tells her, I've prepared a presentation for you so you can get on your trail. I'll, I'll give you all the details. We have your debrief ready to go for you. And she suggests to her that she needs to bring back on board Sabine Wren, um, who will have the ability she needs to unlock this map. Yeah, absolutely. And also, you know, she's the one that says, well, if Thrawn survived, does that mean... Ezra Bridger survived, mm-hmm. um, which I really hope so, personally. Yeah. Um, but because, nice. <laughs> you know, she was also a key member of the Rebels. That, of, Absolutely. And it was her, along with Ezra, Kanan, uh, Sabine, and Chopper, mm-hmm. and Zeb, that, you know, they were all together as yeah. this tight-knit team. So Absolutely. I like that she sort of, you know, asks that question because... Mm-hmm. So at the end of Rebels, you know, spoilers, I guess, if you want to go and watch it. Mm. So um, both Thrawn and Ezra are taken off in Thrawn's Star Destroyer by these kind of whales of space that yeah, have... Space whales, yeah. Space whales. Yeah. I can't remember the name of the, the, the animal, but that can do hyperdrive effectively. Yes. And so they kind of wrap around the the, the Star Destroyer and hyperdrive into space to an unknown location exactly so there is hope for uh general sindula as well and that you know part of the way into um asking for sabine's help because of ezra bridger yeah. who is their long lost friend absolutely absolutely um and uh, sindula herself was effectively the leader of the group she was the one that was the captain of uh ghost their ship she was yeah. the one that that set them off on the missions while she stayed behind with the ship effectively but they were very close to the team a family really that fought all the way out throughout um the initial setting up of the rebellion yeah so, absolutely uh, that's quite cool one of the other interesting things here is we get this name drop from home one mm. as they call out the the call sign of Fulcrum as the contacting uh, Ahsoka's ship as yes, she's coming do. into sort of land on the other Republic cruiser that has come uh, alongside the, I guess, the Scuttle's new Republic cruiser yes. because of Balin and, and his apprentice. Uh, and Fulcrum is in episode one of Rebels, and it later transpires that Fulcrum, this kind of uh, secret sign is is Ahsoka. Yes. Uh, it's also then taken on by one of the Imperial officers in Rebels who is actually working for the Rebels yes. um, as, as a spy and an infiltrator Absolutely. into the Imperial Navy. Yeah, so, like Fulcrum's massively important. Yeah. I, I actually joked watching it that now you can just skip the first two seasons of Rebels because that was <laughs> one of the only mysteries that was in there for those first two seasons. I'll be honest, as I say, I'm a big fan of Rebels. I have seen the show multiple times, but that first couple of seasons... It's really difficult to recommend to people any show that goes on for four seasons and say, well, the first season, not too bad. Just get through that one. And then you get into the second season. And most of that's pretty good. And then you get into the third season. That's amazing. I did watch the first season while doing other things. Yeah. The- Just popping my head up when things were interesting. But by the time I got into midway through season two, I was watching every single episode. Yeah. The final yeah. uh, two seasons for me are absolutely 
bang on. Yep. So this reveal that Ahsoka Tano is Fulcrum uh, allows you to probably skip a lot of the first season, yeah. unless you just want to spend time with the characters. Exactly. Yeah. But it's a cool, a cool little callback uh, that that she still uses that call yes. sign uh, with Absolutely. with Home One. That's very cool. Uh, let's get on to our blaster point number three because we're going to talk about Sabine. <laughs> So yeah, blaster point number three. Sabine cracks the code. Ahsoka has to go to uh, the planet Lothal to meet Sabine. And that's the last place we saw Sabine. Right at the end of Rebels, we saw her on the planet. I was so impressed with how this translated directly from oh, that final scene yeah. of Rebels, where we see Sabine in the comms tower that she's made her home. Um We saw Ahsoka's ship arrive on Lothal, exactly the same uh, ship that Ahsoka's now uh, traveling in. And you see the central city of, of Lothal, uh, which looks exactly the same as it did in that artwork in, in uh, the animated version of, uh, of, of the show. So uh, all of the attention to detail that, of course, Dave Filoni would bring with them uh, from the animated series here in live action. Very cool. Absolutely. And also uh, is the there is the mural um, that is of course. dedicated to those rebel heroes uh-huh. that liberated Lothal, which is also straight from uh, the animated series it at is. the end. Um, and it's just so cool. Also as well, Sabine Wren now is a commander. Yes, she is. Uh, and she certainly doesn't want to give a speech. So you get a nice little kind of introduction to her on mm. her speeder, trying to get back to the old communication tower, which is her home. Um, yeah. She's a fighter. Yeah, absolutely. You know, she's she's a Mandalorian at heart. She yeah. has got fight in her, for I sure. I do really like this setup of the character because, again, you know, a lot of people do know Ahsoka. She's been in um, in one Star Wars movie. She was in all of Clone Wars. She's one of those characters that, again, making that transition to Mandalorian, probably people learned about her there for the first time. This is the first time we're seeing Sabine in live action. So you have to do a bit of an introduction to her. You've already done the fighting introduction with Ahsoka and the battle introduction with Balin. So here we have Sabine, um, where we get a bit more of her rebellious spirit, I suppose. Well, yeah, I'm, um, I'm playing chicken with uh, interstellar fighters uh, exactly. while she's on a speed. But also the governor is trying to, you know, rally everybody around the fact that she is a hero and she's living on the planet. Nobody else is living on the planet. Everybody else that's in that mural has left, all gone. Yeah. And she doesn't even want to go up and take the praise for that in front of the population of the planet, effectively. Yeah, so, and I really um, like this touch, actually, as we get to her home. Because, one, she has a, a loath cat as her pet. I love the loath really cat. Cool. I yeah. kept looking at our podcast, Charlie, uh, thinking it was him that was meowing until uh, until I looked up again yeah. and saw the loath cat is it, right there on screen. It was really good. Very cute. You know, as she's... Um, putting the bowl of food down for the cat that you just get the hint of um, her Mandalorian helmet mm-hmm. from Rebels under the table as she feeds the cat. But also there is this sense that she's in a place where she, yes, is doing her duty, all of that side of things, but she listens back to a hologram message from Ezra yes, to her. Does. You know, it it's like... She's caught in the old times, um, you know, the guilt a bit of the fact yeah. that Ezra has gone. Um, you know, he's explaining to her in this uh, hologram message, he had to make that difficult choice as Absolutely. a Jedi. And she is like a sister to him. So, yeah. you know, th- there's this kind of tinge of regret a bit and Absolutely. guilt here and i just thought it was really well done well it's so personal to sabine and that, that's what's important here she's not somebody that is there to be the hero um getting praise for her part in saving lothal she's lost her family yeah she we find out that she's her relationship with ahsoka is broken um they went off together they spent time together as uh as a master and apprentice at one point um but she's also lost Ezra, her best friend, her her yeah. brother. Uh, in her mind, she lost all her family when she when the Mandalorians turned on her as well for her part in, in their destruction. I guess you would you would say in some in some way. Yeah. Um, definitely watch those episodes; they're very interesting. Um, but it's really personal to her, and she's lost everything. She's now all on, all alone here in Lothal, and I think that's a a great way to introduce Sabine. She's got that rebellious spirit, rebellious streak, 
And she's also lost all of her family and she's missing them. And she doesn't know that Ezra could possibly be alive. She might hope he is, but those messages that he left, the one that we saw played for the entire crew of the ghost back at the end of Rebels, where he's telling them he's made this difficult decision to make a sacrifice and hear a personal message for Sabine telling her that he would depend on her to ride out the rest of the rebellion effectively. Yeah, exactly. So both of them point to the fact that Ezra's gone and never will be coming back. But you also see with her relationship to Ahsoka, yeah. um, you know, it's not easy. It's it's pretty tense and awkward. You know, mm-hmm. there's even a point where uh, the, the droid who who Yang has to leave the ship uh-huh. because they are two strong women butting heads here. You know, Absolutely. they've got their opinions, they've got their views, and as well, the in the same sense that it's probably because they're cut from the same cloth you know as as what comes out from this ahsoka you know she left before she was fully enrolled as a jedi Mm -hmm. and the you know she feels that she dropped sabine sabine also you know in a sense the the training the 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 strictness Mm -hmm. of of the jedi way goes against this rebellious streak that she has and so i love how you know this kind of really quite tense relationship of these two uh, plays out uh, as well and you yeah. see here Hera being almost a bit of a counselor for, for the two of them yeah. across these two episodes yeah she kind of she kind of saying you know I thought by the two of you both being so powerful so strong and so alike that that would make this whole relationship work yeah. but it's actually ended off with the two of them butting heads um quite a lot which is why Ahsoka goes straight for the um jugular i guess when uh, she's passing over the map to sabine for help she goes straight for the heart of the of the matter yeah we're here if you help me out we could possibly find yeah. ezra bridger alive you know exactly um, really i like think that. i know how to find ezra mm-hmm. she says yeah completely to the point and yeah. to bring her on board really really like that um and i i like that you know in in looking at the the star map and she ultimately gets off the ship to think more clearly. You know, she asks Ahsoka <laughs> if she can um, take it away so she can think more clearly. And yeah. Dara say, you know, the unspoken bit about that was Anna away from you. So, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, so I just, I've not got you telling me what to do all the time. Yeah. Um, and, you know, even here with this important artifact that the two of them, you know, collide um, as Ahsoka wants her to stay and forbids her leaving, and she just does it anyway in order yeah. to get the space to think about it in yes. her own surroundings. I didn't think it was a good idea for Sabine to take it anyway. I no, think, not I, at all. In this case, I do think Ahsoka was right to go, hang on, you, uh, how about if I leave the room and you continue to work on it, maybe? Agreed. Uh, let's, let's make some kind of compromise here. But the minute Ahsoka walks out of the room, Sabine's taking it. There was never any question that Sabine was going to take this map back home with her. Agreed. Yeah. But when someone always gives the opposite side, uh-huh. or if someone is always saying no, or yeah. if you feel like that, you're going to rebel against them. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know? No. Um, so... And hey, she's oh, one of the rebels. So, yeah, exactly. yeah, of course she was going to. Of course she was going to. Um, but she does bring it back to her comms tower, uh, with her loth cat, who's, uh, who's, uh, hissing and, uh, and braying at the, uh, at the map, uh, throughout her process of cracking the code. But she does crack it. Um, she uses her own abilities to find how you can open this, how you can get the key to open this. Uh, discovers the map, finds that there is this map inside, which does point to a location, but their big challenge now, the third challenge of the three is, where does the map start from? And so here they are, you know, they've already retrieved the map from an impossible location. They've now um, decoded the map to find out um, where the location of Thrawn potentially and Ezra possibly is. And now they will also have the next level of that, which is where does the map start from? Because the map's no good. Yeah, she's not fully point. deciphered it yet. Yeah, um, exactly. And unfortunately, before uh, she does then she's attacked by the same type of uh, assassin mm-hmm. droids uh, as Ahsoka encounters. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, again, this was just really good. First of all, the cat hissing, you know, 
six cents and all Absolutely. that. Um, Cats and, are great for that. Yeah. But you, we have this great, uh, uh, there are two things on this for me. I think I love the fact that the assassin droids, uh, as one was holding her back, the mm-hmm. other one went in, but then destroyed her consoles yep. and all the information that she'd managed to accrue mm-hmm. from it. And then just the lightsaber, um, battle between her and Shin, yeah. the the apprentice. She's got a and bit of skill. Yeah. She's got some skill, but Shin has more skill. And the thing I loved about Shin's fighting style was her use of the cloak as mm-hmm. a distraction. Yes, I just thought cool. it was really, really good. Because, you yeah. know, occasionally you see the Jedi, they'll take their cloak off when yeah. they fight. Or you kind of go... Is this kind of like the superhero moment with the cape, but it gets caught in a jet engine right. <laughs> um, type thing for okay. Jedi's? Yeah. Um, but I loved how she used it to kind of distract and blind yeah. her opponent, in this case, Sabine, um, Mass in the, the battle. Of, of it was the really, yeah. really cool. It I was. loved the style that yeah. they brought to Shin's fighting. It felt some, like something really new, didn't it? Yeah, it did. Um, yeah. And I suppose one of the things I do really like is about Sabine. I know you wouldn't expect her to be as uh, well trained as Shin. Shin's an apprentice Jedi. She's being trained by a master Jedi. We've already mentioned Ahsoka never finished her training. So technically, she's not a master Jedi. She does take on the apprentice of Sabine. But we find Sabine also doesn't have much in the way of force powers. Uh, Hu Hu Yang says, you know, he's been around for thousands of years. And Hu Yang says, I've dealt with many, many Jedi and you wouldn't match up to any one of them in terms of your force abilities. Well, those Padawans. Um, Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, So that's not the thing with Sabine. Sabine will be someone that if she's trained in the abilities of a Jedi by using uh, another weapon like the lightsaber, She's a Mandalorian as well, um, and we see her skills with the with the with the droids, the assassin droids that she's fighting. We can see her fighting skills. Yeah, she also has tech abilities. She also has amazing abilities um, on her on her speeder um, as well. So she's one of these characters that has multiple great abilities and isn't limited by just being. Um, a, a Jedi or just being a, a Mandalorian. Absolutely. She has a lot of other abilities. And as well. we do have to remember that for a brief period in Rebels, she did own the Dark Saber. Yes, she did. Yes, she did. Dark Saber that you would have seen in uh, in live action over on the, on the Mandalorian. Yeah, uh, exactly. Show, uh, which does bring me to a question as well. Go on. Um, as Sabine is a Mandalorian, they've already set that up for anybody that didn't know that. They've been really clear here. You had the whole process of her. Um, not wearing her, her Mandalorian outfit. And by the end of this episode, we, of uh, the second episode, we see her in her full Mandalorian gear with the helmet on and all that kind of stuff. Mandalorian's a very popular series. And if you remember back to the last season of the Mandalorian, we had our little Grogu seeing some space whales outside. Yeah. Um, will they connect those two stories? Will we see Pedro Pascal's Mandalorian? Um, Din Djarin and Grogu appearing at some point in here. Possibly. Ahsoka knows them really well, yeah, right, at yeah. this stage. So um, I think there's a, a nice tie-up there that you could have a connection there. Um, hopefully it won't go the same way as uh, as Boba Fett um, and their Mandalorian episode, which was the big standout episode of the season because Mandalorian and Grogu were there uh, doing an episode of Mandalorian in the middle of Boba Fett. Uh, hopefully it's not that. Hopefully they'll just have a connection with with them and find the information that they need about these space whales that could be traveling around somewhere. Yeah, no, I mean, weird. Like, I, I really like the the Mandalorian, uh, but I think already in these first two episodes, I think Ahsoka is a much more direct, on point series, a John type of show as well. Yeah. John type of Star Wars, without a doubt. Yeah, yeah, for sure, without a doubt. Uh, so, yeah, loving it. Um, so, yeah, hopefully there will be those connections. But mm-hmm. we leave Sabine at the end of episode one. Uh, having been seriously wounded uh, by Shin uh, with a, a lightsaber through kind of the side of her midriff. Absolutely. I'll tell you right now, when, when I watched this the first time, um, <laughs> knowing that both episodes came out the same day really did help because sometimes when we get previews for uh, for episodes of Star Wars, they do give us two episodes, but they're one a week. And I thought this was going to be the cliffhanger. And I was going, you just brought in Sabine, you just set her up, you just showed that she's got skill with the lightsaber. She, um, she was a Mandalorian as we knew from, from the character in, uh, in the animated series. And now you've killed her at the end of the first episode. <laughs> yeah, Don't you dare. Uh, so very happy to, uh, roll credits and then start new episode, uh, very quickly afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I think on to our saber point number four. <laughs> 
Absolutely, yeah. On to episode two. And I think we need to talk about uh, the Corellian conspiracy, is what we're going to call uh, this kind of half of the episode. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I think this is the first time we've been to Corellia in TV shows, at least live action TV shows. Certainly live action, um, yeah. Which was quite cool, just because with the Millennium Falcon coming, uh, being having been built uh, in the Corellian shipyard. It's a Corellian ship, yes. Yeah, yeah. so... I, I thought this was really cool, and I, I liked how, um, you know, for me, this whole thing tied into one of the other great Star Wars series that we've had in the last 12 months, which is Andor as well, mm-hmm. and was a theme of uh, the Bad Batch as well, this idea that an empire doesn't uh, become a republic overnight, you know, despite mm-hmm. the the rebels having won um, and and destroyed the second Death Star, you know there are still uh, as the 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 manager of the the Corellian shipyards says he says you know there are ex Imperials at every level of the New Republic mm-hmm. to keep this place operational and um, absolutely they, they worked under the Empire and he says you know my loyalty is to my investors and the thing is is that in this case the investor is. Elspeth, who used to have uh, dockyards there supplying hyperdrives to the Empire. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I, lo- I love this um, this turn in the story. This this idea that you know, there's it's not just a black and white story. It's not just that story of rebels versus Empire. There's loads of other people caught up in it, and that's one of the things that made Andor so special. It was about a galaxy of people, um, not all of chosen sides. Some are just working. Uh, for the money and the people that they're working for have uh, have chosen a side which aligns them with either rebel or or uh, or empire so uh, a, a nice little melding of that in here in a, in a bit more of a simple way is you, you see that you know uh up the empire kind of thing or for the empire yeah uh, as the uh the other workers in the in the shipyard uh turn on ahsoka and um and hira as they try and find the information in there but but i but i like that whole piece you know i liked i liked um how they use the head of the droid that stayed behind yeah. to find this um, connection to Corellia, and that it is General Hero Sindula and uh, Ahsoka that go to the shipyards. General Sindula, somebody well respected within the New Republic, yes, being told by the people at the shipyards, you don't have clearance for the information that you're looking for. I love the reaction on the face of Mary Elizabeth Winstead uh, as Hero Sindula when she's told, um, "You don't have clearance for that." It's kind of like a wait. Hang on a second. Well, ex- I definitely have clearance for this. <laughs> yeah. There is nobody you could speak to that will have more clearance than I have. <laughs> well, exactly. She has five streps or lozenge clearance, <laughs> uh, according to her uniform. I love the fact that they've carried the NAF rebel Absolutely. uniforms from the original trilogy over into this because yeah. um, you see some with two blue mm-hmm. uh, streps or lozenges, um, but <laughs> General Sindula um, has five red she uh, strepsil Maybe lozenges orange. as well. Maybe um, so that that was yeah that was really good. And of course, we should not forget it was not just Ahsoka and it Hera was because it was Droid Designation C one dash ten P, aka Chopper. Yes, it um, was. Which I must say, uh, I squeaked. I maybe little bit of pee i don't know uh it looked amazing um yeah. i'm really really pleased just that oh, 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 oh. and you're trying to pick out the words as well as you know has he just done the f word there Absolutely. you know yeah. our lovely cute sort of impatient fairly abrasive murderous droid is yes. back yeah and dare i say it i really hope i don't know if it's going to happen uh-huh. but i can see Hu Yang and Chopper being almost like the new C-3PO and R2-D2. Ooh, I like that. If there is that coming together of yeah. these two. Because I actually really also liked uh, Hu Yang here as Sabine is recovering and recovers. You know, that conversation be- between uh, the two of them where Hu Yang is brutally logic in a helpful oh, way, where he does say, you know, your force abilities would have fallen short of all the patterns I've known before, yeah. you know, but, you know, he's trying to heal that relationship between 
Ahsoka and Sabine. Yes. You know, Sabine asks the question, would you have come to me uh, if you could have unlocked the, the star map? Yeah. You know, and he's Was just I on like, plan? like yeah. um, that's irrelevant, exactly. you know. Yeah. Uh, healing healing I, with logic. I love it, it. it was. Yeah. And I can just ultimately see these mm. two um possibly coming together yes. um uh, as the the new c3po and r2d2 I love that. if that's even on the cards i love that because they've got to know each show. other as well the, the two of them have to have spent some time together here yeah. here in ahsoka know each other really really well so i'm sure at some point chopper has been on board um her her t9 ship uh and met up with hu yang so um yeah i love our little murderous droid in here i think he's very cool um well so. it was good it was so good you know as they see this huge hyperdrive and yeah. as it's just being taken off uh world by a transporter ship uh-huh. and you have Hera and chopper going to the the phantom to try and order it back and uh-huh. in the end with with the tracker and you know you're just there trying to listen to you, you can kind of sense that chopper is saying have you been through my stuff? As you can't find the the trackers, and um, possibly even a bit of swearing there. Sure, there was. Um, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Go check out YouTube. Uh, there's a great video of uh, of Chopper's words replaced <laughs> with uh, with swear words, um, yeah. or ad- added to with swear words. Let's say. So it was yeah. really good, and of course, voiced by Dave Filoni. Yes, with heavy modifications. Well, of course, of course, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, of course, he's going to uh, appear back as Chopper as well. Um, yeah, great little, great little character. Nice little introduction again got a big smile on my face um as he's uh, as he's giving out to Hera I love that as they take off you see him kind of banging the side of the ship going hang on a second what are you doing here yeah. <laughs> you know? like why are you not firing uh, exactly. I love that he's kind yeah. of you know what are you doing yeah. I think he, he says uh, yeah. as he's chattering and flailing his his little robotic arms exactly. around um and you see the the little satellite dish come out of his head as well as yeah. he's searching for the tracker uh, and of course they do locate it and find that this um transporter ship has gone to the denab system yeah yeah just one other thing to touch upon uh on corellia just this fight between ahsoka and the assassin droid and marok um the agent that's been sent to collect this eye of Sion. i yeah. absolutely love this battle but i love how it starts as well because it feels really dynamic there's an element of Anakin Skywalker to it as well, yeah. but I thought that uh, moment where where Ahsoka looks out the window is told the droid is about to leave planet on that transporter there, and she literally just smashes the window in front of her, jumps straight out, and dives straight into battle. That feels very Anakin Skywalker from Clone Wars and from uh, and from Attack of the Clones. Yeah, ab- absolutely. Yeah. Um, I loved, uh, yeah, I loved that as well. I think um, I also like the fact that. Pretty much every member in the control room that they're in, you know, they, they shout out for the Empire. Well, yeah, yeah. They have to deal with them. But yeah. also then, yep, yeah, that, that sort of jump out. I thought the battle was really good. I loved how she used the assassin droid once she had skewered him mm-hmm. with the lightsaber as yeah. almost like a shield for then this other lightsaber wielding and certainly force sensitive because he was yeah. able to pull it back his, his lightsaber mm-hmm. very inquisitor type it looked jedi, like the inquisitors yes yeah, the jedi inquisitors yeah. that were kind of a portion of vader's arsenal um as well yeah they were well, they were sent to hunt the jedi yeah. um the remnants of the jedi yeah. yeah and we i know we saw uh reva in the obi one series who yeah. was a who was a a, a uh, an inquisitor sent to hunt uh obi one so that's what I think Marek might have been maybe in the past. Um, may or, not be now. But. Or even a proto-Inquisitor, but just because mm-hmm. the, the uniform looked less developed. Okay. Um, and with that disc-like uh, lightsaber as well. Yes, so, that is generally what all the Inquisitors use, is that, is that type yes. of, of lightsaber. Um, uh, very cool. But it's just the reason why I wouldn't say proto is because yeah. it's so far after the original Inquisitors that we met. That's it. And they are in Rebels as well. Yes. Yeah. Inquisitors and Rebels. But it just, the uniform looked more matte. It looked less like the the uniforms that you see in Rebels. Yes. Yeah. And maybe also from like Fallen Order as well, uh, mm-hmm. the game, the yeah. Star Wars game. 
So it's probably just a design thing. Yeah. So yeah, not proto for sure, yeah. but certainly could it could it just be simply that you know they think that most of the Jedi's are gone, so they've moved on to other careers like mercenary, exactly. Like Balin, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, hmm. Because at, at this stage, Vader is gone. Yeah. Yeah. So they're not on the hunt for the Jedi's, or else they'd be out after Luke Skywalker right now. Right? Yeah. So okay. it, yeah, it's a new gig for the Inquisitor, exactly. one of the Inquisitors. And I did like that final moment with Merrick where they pull back the lightsaber and it goes past Ahsoka with just a slight move of her head in more annoyance than anything else. It's like it was well, very, very suave what she yeah. does for me. I, I thought it was class actually, um, and just it's still locked on to Merrick. Well, she, you yeah. know, locked on. And she just kind of dips her shoulder and moves it to the side so yeah. that it, it just brushes past her. Like, yeah. she's that force sensitive in, a, in effect. She exactly. knows exactly where she needs to be. And I yeah. just thought uh, it, it reeked of class. Yes. I was just like, that is proper good. Very cool. Very cool. It uh, did remind me a little bit of uh, the first meeting of Captain Marvel um, yeah. when she arrived and, and Thor pull back me all near and it just kind of brushed her hair uh, and Captain Marvel had no real reaction yeah, to it. exactly. Just focused on the target at that specific moment, you know. Uh, that's what I felt like with Ahsoka. Very cool. Uh, that's our point number four. Let's go on to our final point. Yes, off Sabre point number five. <laughs> we are on the pathway to Peridia. Um, yeah, a bit more of the mystical element again, and a bit more yeah. of uh, of Morgan Elizabeth and uh, and what her plan is, I suppose. Um, yeah, coming I'm, out in the second episode. Well, I loved uh, I, I love Balin and Shin. You know, the on Cetos, uh at in this sort of on this ritual uh, kind of spiritual mm. platform or observatory, ultimately in yeah. the end. And you have Elspeth arriving, and she's using her power uh, to activate it and i loved how it kind of enveloped this structure importantly as well again it's it's to the mysticism of it yeah which is really good but also like two other things for me as well because balin is unsure about like the architecture and the design of yeah. this it isn't jedi it's not sith and mm -hmm. uh, that you know he asks the question you know what is this? And she says, the shrine is from an ancient people from a distant galaxy. And the map in and of itself is showing a second galaxy. So there is an extra galactic element here mm -hmm. to this galaxy far, far away. It's to me, this feels certainly at least on TV and the movies, yeah. you know, that we could be heading out of the galaxy far, far away to mm -hmm. another galaxy yeah. further away <laughs> or nearer. Um, and yeah. um, if this is going to be, if this is going to be something like Battlestar Galactica 1980, where it all ends off that they're on Earth, um, that Ezra Bridger <laughs> and Grand Admiral Thrawn have been around Earth, <laughs> well, that would be a real shock. Yeah. Well, I don't think it will be. No, but. I don't think so. And <laughs> interestingly, I don't know enough about the old republic mm -hmm. and, and that far back even in this galaxy yeah let alone potential for other ancient civilizations uh -huh. that may have been the basis for jedi i mean i don't know i really yeah. don't know i kind of read somewhere it was, it's referencing a particular civilization okay. that could also be the explanation for all the star destroyers Okay. That you see in the rise of Skywalker, some kind of explanation around that. Now I don't know. Yeah. I, I kind of read it and thought, oh, I don't think that's going to be the case. But nonetheless, that sounds like a theory. I, I'm more thinking that Corellia built all of those ships. Um, now that uh, Corellia is building ships for uh, well, there, there is <laughs> that the, as the well. But of I think just having the extra galactic element here is kind of really important it is interesting and, and, yeah, yeah it's at really least for me yeah, yeah. it's very new yeah it um, is definitely for, for star wars um and the fact they have to get this eye of scion to add to their um abilities to travel to this location that's a massive um extra piece of equipment that they need on top of regular hyperdrives it feels a bit like mass effect um yeah absolutely. you know that, that they have to create this mass effect machine to jump to this other galaxy well so, that's it uh, because this is yeah. like one of a number of hyperdrives mm -hmm. in this 
circular ship, effectively. Yeah, yeah. Which is orbiting just outside of the planet Cetos mm-hmm. here. And, of course, Chopper's tracker has located um, at least the ship in this system and by the planet. You have that really good moment at the end where they are talking with her as holograms and... You know, she says nothing can stop us now. Um, mm-hmm. and effectively code that Balin and his apprentice, along with Marok, uh, must go and get Ahsoka and stop her. Uh, because you have Balin kind of troubled reaching out to the, the force and, and Elspeth asking him, well, what, what do you feel? Yeah. And he says, like, Ahsoka's path is, is cloudy. But I can see great determination. Yes. You know, she will try to stop us. She will come. And yes. she will yeah. come and she will try to stop us. Mm-hmm. And she needs to be stopped Absolutely. before she stops us. Elspeth. Yes. Um, and destroy her plan. So it feels really, you know, just the way that was delivered, you felt Ahsoka's determination just from Balin saying it. And I, I thought it was really really well done. I also like that Shin, after Elspeth had activated the the star map, and there were these tales uh, of the pathway to Peridia, which Balin was saying, well, these were just tales that were told to young Jedi, Mm -hmm. almost like fairy tales. Um, And Elspeth kind of says, no, they're rooted in truth. Mm -hmm. Like all good fairy tales. Like all good fairy tales. And Shin says, well, what does this mean for us? And uh-huh. Balin, like, is it means power. Um, yes, power like you've never known before. Exactly. And as we as we know from uh, uh, the very, very original uh, Star Wars power is the path to the dark side, right? Absolutely. So if they're not there yet, they're definitely on the path <laughs> to the dark side, uh, not just the pathway to Peridia. So I'm just wondering, you know, will there be the case because... Whilst Balin's loyalties may be orange, mm-hmm. um, I feel Shin is much more Sith. Um, yep. And will she follow the Sith pattern that the Apprentice ultimately kills the Master? Oh, potentially. So yeah, potentially. Uh, Balin could be getting snotted by his Apprentice. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Uh, I'll be, it, it, it's just a really great kickoff to the series. Uh, overall uh, that's our main saber points any notes anything else you want to add to the discussion about the first two episodes john and the only one is that the governor on lothal is played by clancy brown yes and is. in the same way as with david tennant he is uh, returning to the character mm-hmm. that he played in rebels the animated series yes he wasn't the governor in in that but he was an ally of the rebel team so yeah really Good to see old Clancy Brown uh, returning. Absolutely. Absolutely love Cl- Clancy Brown and pretty much everything he's yeah. done. Um, we cover him here on TV Podcast Industries because he voices one of the characters on Invincible. So uh, we'll see him back for Invincible Season 2 as well. But nice to have a little nod there uh, to the character. I love when they weave in uh, people from the original source material. We saw that with uh, with The Last Last of Us uh, earlier on this year where the uh, actors who played um, the characters in the video game also got parts in the show as well. So yeah. uh, this is kind of cool that we have... Uh, people like David Tennant coming back to a reprise role he played 10 years ago um, as Hu Yang and now Clancy Brown as well. And, of course, they floaty back as Chop. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and actually, on that, fellow Rebels, um, you know, if you want uh, a little thing to do, I've been talking about the designation c one dash. 10p mm-hmm. uh, just write that down and see <laughs> what it may look like um and in terms of how uh chopper got his name yeah it's kind of cool when you write that down it well. is, yeah, yeah yeah i like it i like it good stuff then last thoughts final thoughts overall john how would you rate this at the beginning of star wars ahsoka the first two episodes of star wars ahsoka and um, for both episodes together, I would give this five chopper trackers out of five, mm-hmm. uh, for sure. What a start. Um, I just really immediately, my brain went straight back to Rebels yes. and loads of other connections in Star Wars. You know, that it's one of the things I think Dave Filoni does so well. He ultimately, I think, knows and understands this lore that George Lucas created mm-hmm. um, in this galaxy. And I really like seeing 
um, the stuff that he does in the Star Wars galaxy. Yep. And so to have his first live action, really good. To see these characters that I've absolutely loved through the Rebels animated series, yep. in particular Chopper, coming to life. <laughs> yes. And, you know, we, we've had Zeb as well in Andor, uh, having these... Yeah, we had him as live action yeah, in Andor as well, yeah, like, yeah. Having these characters being portrayed yeah. in live action um, is just such a thrill uh, for me. Yeah. I, I love that as well, you know, that dark threat hanging over it all is Grand Admiral Thrawn. Mm-hmm. And um, I just really, really enjoyed the action. It was superb. I loved the kind of the mystical element to it. I love how Filoni delved into the Force and the mysticism of the Force. Yeah. Um, in in his shows, and Absolutely. that's come through again for me. Yeah. You know, Balin not, Skull... Not a mention of midichlorians at all. No, well absolutely. <laughs> um, Balin Skull, really enjoying Ray Stevenson as uh, this character yeah. um, as well. I think, you know, it's it's just... It feels really powerful. It feels really Jedi, you know, Force wielder-like. Uh, and, and also with Natasha Lou Bordizzo, um as Sabine Wren. I think she's oh, really, really good. I yeah. mean, all of them are, but, I, you know, I've just really enjoyed those uh, two portrayals um, as well yeah. in, in this. So, I mean, for me, I would probably give episode one, just to split them out as well. For episode one, Master and Apprentice, I would have that as four and a half. Right. Uh, reveling Rebels out of five. <laughs> Excellent. And uh, for episode two, I would have that as uh, 4.5, licking Lothal Cats out of five. Very as good. Well. I thought you said the second episode was going to be a five because Chopper's well, in it. Well, it probably an extra would be. <laughs> I, I think episode two is it's, it's a little simpler. It's a little yeah. sort of more straightforward exactly. with Corellia and then the star map yep. being activated by Elspeth. But, um, yeah, Chopper probably bumped it up to 4.5 Excellent. for sure. But Excellent. overall, I love these two uh, opening episodes. Yeah, I love these two episodes as well. Really great start to the season. I love that it gives a really good reason why everybody's back together. It puts everybody on the uh, on the opposite side to each other. We have our good guys. We have our bad guys. Um, a proper good fantasy story. So I'm uh, really looking forward to covering this every week. I'm looking forward to hearing Chris's thoughts on the show. Chris wasn't a watcher of, uh, of Rebels. He did obviously cover uh, the Bad Batch with us on, on here on the podcast. So he does like the animated shows, but never got around to watching Rebels. So I'm intrigued to hear his thoughts. All I got was a, te- was a text from him going, those were effing amazing, <laughs> was the text we got after we watched the two episodes. So uh, great stuff. I think we need a drink after that, John. We pop on over to the cantina for our cantina quiz. Yes. So in the cantina quiz, as you mentioned, uh, we give you a question on each of the episodes. Uh, there'll be two this time. Uh, gather together all the questions Answer them and email us to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com at the end of the season, and you could be in with the chance of getting your hands on some Star Wars Ahsoka goodies. Yes. So, John, um, you have a question for each episode? I do, Excellent. yes. Two questions here, fellow rebels, fellow quizzes. Uh, good to have you back at the cantina. Um, so, question one for episode one. What are the two types of lothal animals that are in the mural dedicated in honour of the rebels? Oh, very good. Very good. You can also get a bit of that from episode two Mm -hmm. as well, you know, if you don't fully catch it in episode one. So it's not exclusively a uh, episode episode one question. question. Yeah. Uh, But episode two, um, Mm -hmm. the question for episode two is... How many Lothcats heads pop up out of the long grasses on Lothal? Oh, very good. That's as Ahsoka's arriving to Sabine's yes. house, I guess, the, the yes. calm terror. Yes. Very good. Very good. Do you want to give the two questions one more time, John? I will. What are the two types of Lothal animals on the mural dedicated in honour of the rebels? Okay. And how many loath cats heads pop up out of the long grasses on Lothal in episode two? Excellent. Excellent. We'll give a new question each week uh, on our coverage of 
Star Wars Ahsoka. And as I said, just put them together and email us to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com with all the correct answers and you could get your chance of getting your hands on some Star Wars Ahsoka goodies. Excellent You stuff. can also use that email address, of course, for sharing your thoughts about the episodes. Uh, we are recording on the day of release, so uh, not a huge amount of feedback just yet uh, coming into us. But we do have some feedback over in our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash tvpodcastindustries. First up, we got some thoughts in from Alex Baelish. Yes, Alex says, what makes someone ready? You just know. Let me first say I was holding my breath when they said they were doing live action. I say that because the animation is so good and it can do so many things. This was worth the long wait to get back in the mind of Dave Filoni. Mm -hmm. Holy lightsaber fights. If this is fan service, yes, please. (laughs) Can't get enough of this. The major thing I noticed was the seamless transition they made from the animated to live action is amazing. Mm -hmm. What I just love is how all the shows are so well connected. People may talk about Easter eggs, but his attention to detail in the series is like no other. We have a new Ahsoka. She is different, not as playful as she once was. Mm -hmm. I hope that that part of her will be shown, since that is what I love so much about her. Mm -hmm. I realize she is much older now, but that's what makes her special. My only criticism, and it's just me, is the whole Night Sister witch storyline. I was not a big fan of this in the animated series, but what do I know? <laughs> the bottom line is the band is back together and playing wonderful music again. Excellent stuff, Alex. Uh, thanks so much for the feedback. Completely agree. You know, this is just, um, has been so good seeing these first two episodes. Um, you know, my, from my side, it's a little shame you're not into the whole Night Sister witch storyline. I always kind of found them fascinating. But then, hey, I like Doctor Strange, so I guess uh, <laughs> it's in my wheelhouse. And I just think it adds... I, I think for me personally, it was like after the Metachlorian thing uh-huh. Disaster, from yeah. episode one of the prequels, <laughs> yeah. um, I just felt Rebels connected the Force back to that sort of just mystical unknown element. Absolutely. And, and then actually then with Dave Filoni, I just feel he connected back into explaining it in a way that makes sense and which can be done in, you know, a lot of animated series yeah. uh, episodes. Um, more so than a, a single movie yeah. uh, for episode one. You know, so... I, it, yeah, that, it was it was like the midichlorians thing was like a scientific explanation for something that was fantastical and something that as a kid you go, ooh, I wish I had uh, force sensitive abilities. And then Filoni turned it back mystical again is what it feels well, like. Well, that's yeah. it. And yeah. I, I, I mean, even I think as a kid, just it being called the force yeah. meant, okay, you don't see anything, but you understand then why things could be pushed or pulled. Right, and, yeah, you yeah. Know, even just yeah. that. And I, I think here as well, it's just delving into the other side of the force on force sensitive yeah. people like the Night Sisters, but yeah. also then the animals as well mm-hmm. are on Lothal. That was a, another, um, and, and various characters throughout the Rebels yeah. as well. So, yeah, uh, but I, I get it. That kind of stuff isn't also for, for everyone, but I'm really glad that you're loving these episodes, Alex. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Alex. I was expecting, I was hoping that you'd like it, but I have been wrong before, as I said to you, uh, Alex. I was hoping that you'd like the show because I know you're a massive fan of Ahsoka as well uh, and of Rebels. So, uh, good stuff. Thanks so much for your thoughts, Alex. We also got some feedback in from Russell Hooper, who says, just finished. Oh, my. Oh, my. Oh, my. So good. When Sabine got run through, my heart went in my throat. I told my wife that if Ahsoka had a back to tank on her ship, Sabine might just survive. From the very first moment, this felt like a movie. Production-wise, this is probably the best Star Wars anything since Disney took over, except maybe Rogue One. I have some criticism on some of the characters. However, mostly just nitpicky stuff. Hera's skin is a bit too pale and her cheeks are a bit too thin, for example. Stuff that if the actors act like the characters, I'll forget about immediately. It's got to be tough playing live action versions of popular animated characters. One final thought. The music in the credits is great. I love it. Excellent stuff, Russell. I'm so glad you brought up the music because it's mm. one of my notes that I just haven't mentioned um, in, in the, the podcast so far because yeah. I'm totally with you. I think... Those end, I think, well, the music in general, I really, really enjoyed. Absolutely. I mean, there was 
a little nod to the Mandalorian music, like literally the briefest of nod. And mm-hmm. um, when uh, Sabine is pulling out her Mandalorian armor, yes, and there helmet. is, yeah. Um, but the end credits one um, is just superb. Um, I love how it is that primal element to begin with, and then just goes epic and Mm -hmm. even at the start with that primal type music and you know in some way you get that reoccurring with uh elspeth and the these kind of the the night witches Uh as well i just thought was really good but that that final end credit music certainly when it goes epic weird as this may be and it may have no relevance to it whatsoever but i keep getting hints of the last of the Mohicans Interesting, yeah, yeah. Uh, theme. Yeah. Um, it obviously doesn't sound like that, but yeah. the, just the cadence of that music, um, I just really, it suddenly just felt, I started humming last of the Mohicans uh, really? because of it. So, but yeah, I, I think this music is really, really good. Yeah, it's great. I know, I know Russell was asking me some questions about, uh, the previews that we got for the show and wondering whether there's any post credit scenes or any mid credit scenes and, my response was actually going to be, we watched the credits for both episodes all the way through to the end. There's no post credits there, but I just enjoyed listening to the music as we went, you know, yeah. um, we regularly when Mandalorian's on, we'll watch the entire credits. And you think that's because they do those kind of behind the scenes paintings of, uh, of scenes during the, during the show, but actually the music really grabs you every time you watch the Mandalorian. I feel like already with Ahsoka, I've done the same thing yeah. each time we've watched the episode listened all the way through to the end uh, of this awesome score really love it yeah really yeah. good great great thing. stuff thanks russell absolutely thanks russell we also got an, a message in from richard blaze who says watch them both and at times i forgot i was watching a live show thought it was i was watching an episode of rebels really enjoyed it and can't wait for thrawn to make an appearance and manipulate everyone well that is true <laughs> yeah. yes the man with the plan who knows what everybody's going to do and can predict even when he doesn't know what you're going to do. Uh, very excited to see Thrawn in live action. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. It'll probably be a stinger right at the end of the season uh, saying, come back for season two and you'll see more of Thrawn. <laughs> yeah. But I hope not. I hope not. Next up on Facebook, we have feedback from Dr. Bob Phillips, who says, before a couple of weeks ago, I'd never seen animated Star Wars and did 80% of the abbreviated Ahsoka run-in shows trying to catch up before this arrived. I'm certain that even without that, I would have grasped the boy band broke up vibe, the rebellious nature of the rebels, and the escape room puzzles that litter this show. Having watched quite a few episodes, I got extra thrills from the speeder bike highway echo introducing us to Sabine. The ship is my home line from Ahsoka and seeing the comms tower room in real life. Mm -hmm. I do really need to know more about Mandalorian anatomy, that saber wound, Looked like it went through lower ribs on episode one, but had migrated to mid-abdomen after a neat bit of fixing. (laughs) Really looking forward to chasing the Rastan warrior robots through the Eye of Orion with the 14th Doctor in pursuit. No, wait. HK droids, Eye of Sion, and Hu Yang. (laughs) Plus, the space whales singing at the west coast of Ireland Stonehenge the steampunk galley of Hoyang and the superb end credit sequence were all wonderful. Mm -hmm. Good stuff, uh, Dr. Bob. Glad you uh, enjoyed uh, these episodes of Ahsoka. (laughs) Yeah, I liked your Doctor Who version of uh, (laughs) of these episodes. That's excellent. (laughs) Especially because we have got the Doctor in here, of course. Yes, Uh, as Hoyang. Yes. Um, And uh, yeah, glad you uh, were doing your research as well Mm -hmm. uh, with the 80% uh, looking through the animated Star Wars. Do you feel it's wasted, Dr. Bob? I hope not, because I hope you had a lot of fun watching those episodes and didn't feel like homework for Ahsoka. And now, uh, as you say in your your message, um, unused homework, because you would have got the story otherwise. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Um, and yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Bob, for the anatomy lesson. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'm not too sure how uh, Dave might need it. <laughs> uh, the Mandalorian anatomy is construed. Maybe yeah. there were no ribs involved, or but I, I do know what you mean. It did look a little higher during the infliction of mm-hmm. that wound. 
but uh, and of course it rapidly uh, eased away I guess with the technology the medical it's technology it. in the galaxy far far away yes. back to tanks are a wonderful invention uh, in the well, Star Wars universe there, <laughs> there, was, there wasn't one but th- they did have the medical robot that usually uh, accompanies a back to tank yes. but you're right she would have to have sat in that for a couple of hours or a day or two at least um, so we probably would have seen it if that's what they used uh, I guess medical droids uh, in a galaxy far, far away, can fix lots and lots of stuff. I'm Remember, sure they can. Darth Maul did lose the lower half of his body and was still alive afterwards. <laughs> that so, is true. Uh, the Emperor is still alive as well. So uh, after being thrown down a massive uh, shoot uh, in out into the galaxy, so uh, we don't really know how he came back, but he did. Well, ex- yeah, <laughs> that that is a mystery to be honest. Uh, but good stuff. Thanks, Doctor Bob. Thanks, Dr. Bob. Uh, we also got some emails in from Coffee and Vodka. Uh, an email on episode one and an email on episode two. Uh, he wasn't sure whether we were covering them together or not, John. Uh, so sent the two separately. Uh, first up, Coffee and Vodka says on this episode, Greetings, fellow ceremony skipping defenders. Already having my geek degree in the histories of Firefly, Farscape and pre-Abrams Kurtzman Trek, 1966-2005, there's never been any space in my head for the long and storied history of Star Wars. The light side of this is being able to enjoy a story for story's sake without being bound up in angst over canon-defying discrepancies. The best series thus far for me have been the first season of Mando and, of course, Andor. The elements of tightly edited adventure which marks this first episode of Ahsoka gave me a new hope that this show might join their ranks. Rosario's Ahsoka carries the perfect walking, talking Jedi attitude. Seeing Clancy Brown and Mary Elizabeth Winston were as good as the script allowed them to be, and it's always great to see them whenever they appear. Also noted, another other actor whose upcoming appearance is downright squee-worthy. As for Bradizia Sabine, was it wrong to enjoy watching her fly in the ointment character get a little punctured? I'm assuming she's still all right, and this is just a wake-up call, but we'll see. Off to episode two. Four Jabba the Cats, Fast Brats, and Ganked Scrapped Maps out of five. Peace and take care. <laughs> Coffee and Vodka. P.S. Lightsaber Ballistics. Cool. Great stuff, Coffee and Vodka. Definitely the, the perspective that I, that I want to get more of. Um, people who haven't seen a lot of Star Wars or aren't as uh, deep into Star Wars as we can occasionally go. Uh, it's great to see that you've been able to enjoy it without having that experience and without having as much of the uh, restrictive lore sometimes as can be in uh, in Star Wars. Um, one of the, the most interesting things about Star Wars fans, I think, and their difficulty with accepting new versions of Star Wars is there was a load of books that were written in the time between the first set of Star Wars movies and the next ones, and then they threw them all out. There's loads of people that kind of pinned their hopes on that's how... Star Wars was going to go, well, and that's, that's how true. the galaxy was made up. And dare suddenly, I say, including uh, myself, yeah, uh, with the Timothy Zahn uh, Grand Admiral Thrawn. But Trilogy, yeah. I think he he is one character that has been brought back into canon, yep. and in many respects, uh, the stories of Timothy Zahn have been the inspiration for how he has been brought back. Exactly, and, and Timothy Zahn wrote a new novel uh, called Thrawn very recently, exactly. which is a, a new version of how Thrawn exists in this galaxy. Uh, interestingly for you, John, you might not be aware of this, but uh, this story is who is going to be the new heir to the Empire, which was the original name for that Timothy Zahn novel. So they're it definitely taking was. inspiration out of that. Yeah, because yeah. they're a great set of uh, books. They certainly were. They still exist, even if Star Wars official doesn't want them to be absolutely i read them i read them quite a while ago uh so i might, might go back and read them again and yes coffee vodka you were totally right um that's a little uh puncturing of sabine's ego maybe that she could take on a, a, another apprentice um yeah it didn't it didn't last long so thankfully you were able to watch episode two just like we were i don't think i would have enjoyed that cliffhanger for a week that sabine could be dead Yes, I think it was to. It, I think it was the wake up call, as as you say, mm-hmm. um, and to give the the fright of her life to get her back exactly. on track. Exactly. Let's go on to Coffee and Vodka's thoughts on episode two. He says, greetings, fellow dot, dot, dot. Holy Helio Holograms, Batman. Just found out you'll be doing episode one and two together, so I'll make this one short. Better than the first episode with solid action, character development, fantastic special effects, concise writing and direction, and decent acting. Sabine feels at least 30% less irritating as a Mandalorian than a bratty Padawan. Also, it was great to see House alum Peter Jacobson here. Finally, really liking the droid design. Finally, really liking the droid designs. Excellent from start to finish. Five over-the-top choppers, shifty shipyards, and trickily-tossed trackers out of five. Peace and take care. 
coffee and vodka. Excellent stuff, coffee and vodka. <laughs> um, I'm glad you uh, enjoyed this second episode. Yep. And, uh, and two references to Chopper in your five out of five version. I know, of exactly. It. So I'm suspecting that Chopper was also part of that enjoyment. I hope so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he added, w- he added half a mark to your uh, to your score as well, didn't he? Yeah, I wonder if uh, we will see him murder anyone. <laughs> I think we will. I think we will, yeah. I think his, uh, his kill count's about 40,000, uh, <laughs> as far as I remember. Yes, uh, I believe so, yes. <laughs> I think he took down a couple of Star Destroyers somewhere along the lines. Yeah. So, yeah, the amount of uh, Imperial staff on there. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of reminiscent of that uh, Ribbit Chicken uh, sketch of um, the stormtrooper going back to his family. Mm-hmm. Not after Chopper's Not after destroyed the Star Destroyer. Exactly. <laughs> Good stuff. Glad you really enjoyed the second episode as well. It, it um, Obviously, the first episode always has to do a job of setting things up. And uh, they do have to have those kind of moments where you you kind of get the characters if you've never seen them before. So the second episode did feel like there was a much faster pace to it because you've already established everybody. Well, that's it. I mean, it it really was momentum into, you know, effectively going on the pathway to Peridia. Exactly, exactly. No small chat here. Uh Uh-huh. Great stuff. Thanks so much for all the feedback that you've sent in. You can keep keep sending that in to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com or pop over to our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash tvpodcastindustries. Or hey, you can find us over on Twitter, which we'll still call Twitter, at uh, tvpodindustries as well. Excellent stuff. That's it for our coverage on Star Wars Ahsoka, episode one and two. We'll be back next week, of course, with our coverage of Star Wars Ahsoka episode three. We also have our finale of Good Omens Season 2, which we're really looking forward to talking about. And very soon, we'll be starting our coverage of Wheel of Time over on Prime Video, Wheel of Time Season 2 over on Prime Video. They're releasing three episodes on their first day as well, John. Um, now, not it's sure, getting busy. Yeah, not sure exactly how we're going to cover those three episodes. Uh, most likely, we'll do the same as we've done here for Ahsoka cover uh, all three episodes. But we will be hoping to have Chris on board uh, for those three episodes as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, three of us for three episodes. Huh? Uh, cannot wait. Yes, it's going to get busy, but some really good stuff coming up. So, uh, fellow Rebels, we hope you can join us for the rest of um, Ahsoka, as well as joining us for Good Omens and Wheel of Time that we've got coming up. Uh, remember, we are over on patreon.com forward slash TV podcast industries as well as buymeacoffee.com forward slash TVPI. But of course, importantly, uh, we love uh, to get your support in any which way uh, we can, whether that is through the feedback that we get uh, on each and every episode of the series that we cover, like Ahsoka, uh, but also as well uh, to subscribe and share the podcast because of course sharing the podcast is sharing Sharing the the love. love of course it is of course it is thanks so much for joining us talk to you next time thank you so much fellow rebels for joining us until next week keep watching keep listening and may the force be with you bye bye